Hey everyone, well we are here live on the set of Jay's Recipe for Success. Um, as you can't tell, you know I love this, right? Um, you remember last week my shirt that I had on said Relentless, but what uh, it might say if I were to name what was on that shirt um, is just someone who's so curious about learning about people and that's one of the reasons why we started this show and so that we could bring people's stories and journeys to you. And so today, I am thrilled to have a really good friend uh, here with me, Mark Alfieri, the founder and CEO of Brands Star. I always <laughs> want to say Brands Mark, Brand Mark. sorry. Um, we don't sell TV. It just comes out <laughs> easily, right? No, you're on TV. Right, we're on TV, we don't sell TV. We did right. have Brands Mark in our offices the other yes. day. Yes, <laughs> and so thank you so much for being here. Um, we, I want to hear your journey. I want everyone to hear a little bit about you. Things they might not know. Mm. Um, so maybe little tidbits in there. I'm sure there's a few yeah, uh, a good stories. Um, but also, um, you know, some of the ingredients that you've learned along the way that have led to the success that you're having today. So, um, so first, I, I just want to kind of get people from the beginning right uh to today yeah, right okay. and maybe just just a few highlights about your journey yeah right. well uh, for me is it started in new jersey right moved to florida when i was 10 and uh i have three older brothers and so mm. i'm the my next brother up for me is four years older so kind of had to take care of myself in a lot of ways but with uh, that kind of family my mom a was a little tired no i actually <laughs> i actually figured out my way around that a little bit i used to you know hit my brothers and then tell my mom that you know <laughs> they, they hit did. me right and so i would get them in more trouble but uh you know so but uh you know went to went to school down here in florida and then uh, uh been a serial entrepreneur since i was in high school and then uh went to school at the university of florida but started a business in my freshman year there and uh we have a running joke in my family is that uh, I left Florida five years later with uh, 29 college credits and my oldest daughter Hannah who's at the University of Virginia started college with 44 so <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even know it's if I made it past the high school quality credit yeah so uh, but, but it's good you know yeah but that just goes to show right and and that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to have you on the show when I, I know from, from getting to know you over the past couple of years that, that you are a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. And that's, of course, what one of the things that we're teaching these young people. But there's so many skill sets that go into that, right? Um, and so that was one of the reasons I wanted you here mm. today. Okay. Um, and, and it's interesting because you, you mentioned that about school. And I think that, that we, the pendulum swung for so long that students were told you have to go to college, you have to go to college, right. you have to go to college. And yet there are so many successful people like you yeah. that maybe didn't go to college or didn't finish, only got 29 credits. Um, I would have been one of them, <laughs> except that I had a father who was a dean of students out of college. <laughs> All right, and yeah. so I guess that was not really an option for, for him right. uh, or for me. Um, but I struggled all the way through because I'm a hands-on doer, right. visual, right, learner, people, person. Don't put me in that classroom. Yes. So, so you are a living, breathing example of how students can find their way and be successful without well, that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, for me, though, 80% of the learning is outside the mm -hmm. classroom. Um, so I got the full five-year college experience. I just didn't go to class because <laughs> I had started a business up there that took over my time. Um, but you know, for my daughter who's doing really well in college, I think it just really depends on the personality yeah. and, and the individual. Um, it's certainly you can learn a lot in the classroom and, and those fundamentals. Um, but it is actually one of the things that's, that, that's been interesting for me in my journey is that um, you know, not graduating actually created an insecurity though, mm -hmm. that maybe that as I started building some you know, larger companies that I didn't have the credentials to do it. You know, so I had the street smarts part of it, but mm -hmm. uh, was a little nervous about that. And so that was part of the things that I learned along the way. You know. How did you get past that? Well, I hired uh, several CEOs to run my company that were more of the corporate um, individuals and they did great and I learned a lot from them so I kind of went to college in business mm -hmm. right so the, as opposed to me going to business school business school came to me um, and and so but learning those lessons that even though I, I got g gathered a lot from them um, there was still a whole bunch there that I knew that I could bring to the table and, and I felt more secure about you know taking over the reins and doing those things so. yeah sometimes the academics part that we gain through college isn't always what makes uh, an entrepreneur successful right. yeah. um, and so I think it's more those some of it I, I know I, I use this term uh, as a woman you know it, it's always trust your gut right. um, 
you know, and I'm sure that's the same for men, but there's an intuition that I think a natural entrepreneur has. What was the company that you started in college? You mentioned uh, it was actually a, it, we had a contract with the Gainesville Sun to, to sell newspaper subscriptions door to door. Mm. And we used to get paid to sign people up for the paper because it helped their advertising, you know, the more circulation they had. So right. um, we start, I started that in my freshman year. And, you know, by the time I got to my sophomore year, I was really making so much money doing that, that I, I, I got that false you know, sense of security and, and like, oh, this is always gonna be like this. It's too easy, why do I need to go to college? So, right. um, but exactly. I learned some hard lessons after that. <laughs> you know, one of my favorite books is by John Maxwell. It's called Failing Forward. Mm. And you, know, you learn through your failures in life, not through your successes. Um, you know, success sometimes is a very poor teacher, um, but when you actually have to learn those hard lessons, if you can actually take from them and apply it, then it's a, it's a very valuable thing moving forward. Yeah, I think that's so true. I think I've probably learned, I know I definitely have learned most things and uh, valuable pain. things uh, through pain, uh, yeah, yes, right. and, and through, because I think those things make you stronger, and, and I always tell my daughter, it's not, um, what, you're going to fail, right? right? We're all flawed to some degree, or, or, you know, things just don't work out sometimes the way you think they will. Uh, the question is, how quickly do you get back up? Yeah, so right. obviously, you've learned to get back up. Oh, many times over, right? My, but I, I also grew up in a family. My dad was a serial entrepreneur, so I always watched him you know, start a business. And even if it failed, he would just come and take the lessons from that and dust himself off and do it again, um, which is, is the difference, right? And in, in failing forward, one of the things that they discuss is that you know, if the people who are really successful are the ones that actually take that failure but don't quit, right? You know, it's like Thomas Edison in a light bulb. You know, it's, it's just trying to figure out what's that next iteration to make it work. So that perseverance that's tied to it is a, is a, is a key ingredient, right? I, I, I call it uh, risk tolerance disorder. Um, <laughs> it's not, not, a, not a real ter term, but, um, <laughs> you know, I actually am willing to take the risk right. that most people aren't willing to take, right? right. Um, so, you know, one of my principles is I call it for my team, it's the law of the opposites. And, and that is if you do what everybody else does, you're going to get what everybody else gets. But are you willing to do something different? You know, are you willing to go the other way and, and, and go to a territory that maybe is less traveled, uh, but there's real opportunity there as long as you're willing to, you know, persevere through those tough, you know, navigating a road is, that's never been, you know, uh, driven before is, is bumpy, right? right? So if you can survive the bumps, then you're really going to find a great destination. Yeah. yeah. And so you seem to have found a great destination, right? So Brandstar has been around for quite some time, but has gone through some reiterations and reinvention and all of that. Is it has. that true? When, yeah. when did Brandstar actually So I begin? started in the, the TV production and uh, that business back in 1994, started our first company doing that. And I was just I, like I, 12, and, I think. <laughs> you probably, I thought you were only eight, but um, uh, me, I think I was four when I started it. So. Um, but uh, we started that company and we did really well and then I had sold that off and then, um, but learned a lot of lessons from that. I think we kind of left a lot of opportunity on the table because we, were, we, were, we weren't seeing the bigger picture. So um, in the mid 2000s, I started my second company uh, and from that company is when I brought in the professional leadership, right? Uh, it was, uh, and for that process is figuring out, you know, what, what did I not know? And so I kind of went to school on, on some other CEOs and, and, and we learned things along the way to really evolve to where we're at today. So Brandstar, we have about just over 200 employees and we're um, doing more of what we, the base of what we started out doing, which is really to, uh, our purpose statement as a company is to make a positive impact on people's lives. And our mission statement is we connect people with brands to do life better. So it's solution-based programming, right? I was one of those kids that says, you can't ever tell me you can't do something, right? Can't is not a word in my vocabulary. Uh, as soon as you say can't, we gotta figure out how to do it. <laughs> so I love helping people solve problems that they think aren't solvable. And, uh, and that's really what the genesis of our programs are, is it's solution-based. You know, Everybody faces challenges in their life. But imagine if you could bring a subject matter expert to come and give you some solutions that actually helps you do life better because you're being educated on things that you didn't know there was a solve out there for. Yeah. yeah. So, so through that process, so then you became the CEO. I did. Um, and so then you realized, hmm, wait a minute, yeah. maybe I can do it better than you know, anybody right. else because it's your passion, it's your, it's your baby, right? Um, so that must have helped that 
insecurity part you talked about earlier, thinking that other people could do it better than you. Yeah. So I, I guess Yeah, that it tied into both sides of that for me. I think at that point, which is I just took back over as the CEO and, uh, a few years ago. And, um, but I looked at it and said, okay, what are all the things I learned from you know, folks that had ran major corporations and, and there was great lessons there of corporate governance and, and, um, and those types of things. But I, I came back to my roots and said, okay, what's opposite of a, a traditional corporation? And so for me, it was, if I'm going to do this, I'm gonna take all the things that I've learned, but also the, who I am as a person and uh, decided that we're gonna create a culture first, uh, people first culture in our organization. So um, I yeah, literally sat in front of everybody. That. Yeah, so, <laughs> and that's how it started, just doing it differently. I said, go back to the law of opposites. Well, everybody else does it this way. How about if we do it a different way and try something different that I don't know is gonna work, but right. my gut tells me, as you, and, and I believe that if, you know, if we believe in people, which I'm a high, you know, I have a, a, a high value system in believing in people can be better and helping them be better. It's just a matter of unlocking their potential, so. Yeah, and before we get to the culture piece, because yeah. I was definitely gonna okay. go there with you. Um, so 200 people, you have your skill set. So important, right, to surround yourself with 200 people who have the values, the skills, uh, and the vision, right, and, and buy into the vision um, that around you. Right. Because we are really good at some things, right, but other things not so much. Mm -hmm. So how do you find, um, and I think this is so important, I think it's something that leaders are challenged with all the time, how do you find those right people mm. to build your team with? Yeah, that's always a challenge, right? And so I, I can't say that I figured that out. Um, but for us, you know, my, my recipe is really one of, uh, we used to hire for resume, skills on a list, college education, all the tr traditional stuff that you need to have on there, right? And if somebody had a lot of experience in a particular position, oh, they must be wonderful because they did this for 10 years. And uh, we flipped that on its head. So for me, our, our hiring um, priorities start with it's attitude first. So we do behavioral interviewing to find somebody that has the right attitude. Are they, and, uh, and an attitude means not just an attitude of being positive, um, but it's an attitude of asking them questions about you know, how they solve problems or what was their biggest challenge. Um, what are the things that, uh, that, that keep them up at night or that they struggle with? You know? and, and, and so I'm looking for somebody who uh, uh, has an open attitude to learn, that's curious, yeah. um, and, and somebody who doesn't just get stuck, uh, we call it below the line, you know, blaming and it's everybody else's fault, you know, victim mentality. It's that I'm taking responsibility and saying, you know what, I could have done this better and this is where I made a mistake and people willing to not have that insecurity that they, to admit the mistakes that they've made. So attitude's number one. And then the second thing on our list is energy. We're looking for people who have actually the effort, right? So we believe if you have the right attitude, that you're willing to learn, and you're, you're open-minded, and you're willing to take responsibility for the things that you've made mistakes on, and you have the a effort energy tied to it, then the skills are teachable. Yes, right? I agree. You know, I agree. We can teach them the technical side. You can, um, in most, most roles, right? That. If we want right. to be a rocket scientist, I think we got to go to school for that. Right. But for most of the stuff you can teach, because I, I go back to myself as I didn't go to school, so I might not have had some of the technical skills, college skills, but I had the attitude and the effort and the, that energy part of it. So that's what we look for. And, and, and then I think it's uh, once you've gotten that type of individual on, it, you still can't, um, it, that, that doesn't solve it. You know, people, I don't believe people can be motivated, but I certainly believe they can be demotivated, right? Yeah. I think most people have a motivation that gets blocked by some situation, circumstances, or a boss or a leader that's kind of shutting them down. So for me, it's a matter of helping them, creating an environment that is open and transparent and you know, we care enough to have those conversations that are tough conversations, but we do what we say and we say what we do, right? And so that is an important ingredient to developing a team of qualified people. Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's kind of a theme going on with you, yeah. uh, right? All around. <laughs> We're going to get to the okay. bottom of this. <laughs> and you're going to witness it today. <laughs> We're going to have an epiphany, no. though. Um, just that, that, that whole thing of developing people, teaching people, um, wanting to help people solve problems, right? I'm hearing a theme uh, to who Mark is, yeah. or Mark is, and what, and, you know, what makes you 
um, what makes you tick in yeah. a sense, right? It um, is. So let's talk about those 200 people because I okay. know you and I have talked a little bit about this um, and I know it's a challenge that, again, a lot of CEOs is building that culture. Mm. Um, you know, you can put a bunch of values up on the wall, but that doesn't build the culture. No. Um, but I watched a little video uh, recently uh -oh. that I found that your daughter interviewed you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh. She described, in her interview, she did an internship with you this summer, right. which I, I love that about you. I'm not, I know that it was your daughter, but I know that you also take additional interns oh, yes. into the business, and so I love that you're always trying we to... We learn from them. Yes. I mean, that's, oh, it's, it's, it's our internship world. program. Don't tell, don't yeah, tell them. Don't tell them. <laughs> um, but she described your culture, um, and that the people at Brandstar describe your culture as like no other, mm. uh, and that it's people-centered. Yeah. Um, Wow, how did you do that? How and how long has it taken? And is it a constant thing? It is. Thing? The culture is never, it's like alignment. It doesn't, you know, if you have your car, and as soon as you actually take your hand off the wheel, it can go one way or the other. So alignment is something you have to continue to do, mm -hmm. right? So um, you never get there on culture. But um, I, I basically stood in front of my entire organization and first and foremost said, you know what, we have to hit a reset button here. I'm taking over for the day-to-day -day operations of the company, and I want everybody in the organization, first and foremost, no matter how long you've been there, to open your mind up and say, this is a startup with assets. You know, we've been around for a while, we have all these assets, um, we have great you know, clients and, and production capabilities, but our greatest asset is sitting in this room, which is all of our team, right? And so um, I basically opened everybody up and says, Look, we're going on a different kind of journey here, which is a journey that is around people-centered. And so how do you have that people-centered organization? And I made some promises to my team. And I basically said that it's a culture of transparency. We're gonna be open and honest. You might not like what I have to say, but I'm gonna shoot you straight. You know, um, it's a culture of responsibility and accountability because you can't hold people accountable that aren't responsible. So, mm -hmm. and what I mean by responsible, give them the authority to make decisions and give them the responsibility to, to do the right thing. And then if they don't, you can hold them accountable, but you know, give them a chance to, to, to see how they can prove themselves. And, and then a culture of mutual respect. No matter whether we're, we made a mistake on something or somebody dropped the ball in a particular area, we can always be respectful about how we coach, how we counsel, um, and how we treat each other, right? We spend more time at work than any other place in our mm -hmm. life. Unfortunately, you know, um, it, it, but so that, that becomes our family. And, and so if we can be transparent and we can, you know, you know give people the, the, the trust and let them, if they don't earn it, you know, let them lose it as opposed to earning it, right? right. And, then, and then and always deal with respect. And I think if you have those characteristics, you know, I told the team, this is an 18 month journey for us to even think about building a culture. So I'm not expecting everybody to leave this room and then day one, it's perfect, right? Well, we um, do live in a world of instant gratification, I, you do. right? <laughs> you do, you know, but we gave people something to kind of anchor from so they could actually even engage in conversations. Well, I'm just being transparent because we talked about transparency, you know, and then the other person that's hearing that transparency could say, I, I appreciate the transparency, but you're kind of attacking, it's a character attack. You know, can we do that with a little more respect? Right, um, and, and, and so the team practices that. And it took us, I would say, you know, our first year was amazing. Um, we went from like 90 employees by, but by the time we got to the third and fourth quarter of our first year, we had almost doubled in size. Wow. Right, because That's everybody fast. became owners. They took an ownership interest. They got a chance to be a part of something greater than themselves. And they got a chance to feel responsible for the well-being of the company um, because they, they, they count it, right? They, they mattered. And I would, I, we have a quarterly meeting every quarter where we meet with our entire team and we just have that open, transparent conversation. And, um, and it works, you know? And we create a little fun little program too that's tied to that. Um, that we call it the Whatever It Takes program. So oh, I like uh, maybe that. Maybe I have to share that with you on the next one. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so when we just, we actually just created a program too and it's, it's, it was kind of based around crew, the sport crew rowing. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there's something called the swing in okay. crew, which is when every single member of that boat um, is rowing in synchronization, mm. right? Pulling their best, doing their best. They're in full synchronization, and that's when they're at peak performance. Right. And so we created the swing award, oh, that's, uh, which actually swing stands for different things. Okay, the letters right. stand for different things. Um, 
which were the values that were most important and the traits and the skills that were most important to us. And when you talk about building a culture around these things, I have to assume um, that these are values that you live in your yeah. life, right? Because if you can't be true to the values that you're bringing and expect from the team, yeah. so, um, so is that what you did at first? Did you ask them what, what should be the, the core of the culture or what those things well, that you shared? Well, I think it started with authenticity and transparency, right? So for me, it was always one of those things. That th these are just words on a piece of paper. It has to become a living, breathing action. We're, you know, talk is cheap, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it, because I say something doesn't make it so. But how is the consistency? Are we living out those values, right? And so the culture didn't change until the team started to realize that these weren't just words on a piece of paper anymore. This was something where we're actually behaving the way that we're talking about it or we're writing it down. So that consistency builds trust, right? Um, and so trust is, is, is not just a matter of do I trust you as a good person or do I trust you that you're not going to do anything bad to me. It, trust is about competency. It's about communication. When you're consistent in your communication and your competency and your authenticity, um, then people start to trust you. And when they start to trust you, then they're going to open up and they're going to give you a little bit more of, the, of themselves at that point. Were there people, it's interesting because as you go down this road, some, there are people that shy away from that transparency, right, and authenticity, and they take it as confrontation mm -hmm. or, or something else that's not positive. Um, I, I'm from New York. We don't know any other way to be but <laughs> authentic. I'm Italian. I'm Spanish. <laughs> right. I mean, you're in trouble, right, because yeah. what pops in here pops out here, hopefully a little bit nicer than the way it's up in here sometimes. But but I don't know any other way to be but to be mm. honest with you and tell you what I'm feeling or thinking. Right. Um, and so, but some people I found just yeah. through my own experiences, sometimes people feel threatened by that and they're like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to be confronted mm -hmm. uh, by anybody or I don't want to confront other people. Right. And it's really not about there. So how did you deal with those, those people. people? Well, I think first of all, that reluctancy comes from fear of loss. I'm afraid that I'm, there's going to be a reprisal or there, you know, if I actually actually tell somebody what I really think or really feel, then they're not going to be my friend anymore or they're going to get back at me because it, it becomes more of a personal attack, right? So I, it, it, it's never easy and it's still a challenge today, but it's training people to not be afraid to actually have an open and honest conversation by helping them play out what's the worst case scenario as long as you do it in respect. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about conflict, when, when, when people start attacking each other, all communication stops, right? Now it's just a matter about who's going to win the argument, right? Um, or whose position is the right position. So uh, we do a lot of encouraging. Like I, I tell my team all the time is that I don't want to be right, I just want to get it right. And so sometimes getting it right means is that I got to be willing to be wrong, but if I'm secure enough in the fact that it's okay to be wrong, it's okay to fail, goes back to that top principle, and it's okay to not have all the answers, nobody's going to think less than of you because right. you don't have it all. Matter of fact, it's the opposite, so it goes back to that. The, the folks that are being humble and being open to other people's feedback or being open to constructive criticism, all those things actually creates you to be that person that people want to follow and that people want to have on their team, right? Um, so when I look around at my team, I look at the people who are open, honest, they don't have all the answers. If they make a mistake, they own the mistake. You know, they, they, they learn from the mistake. They don't make the same mistake 10 times over trying to deny that it was them, you know, casting the blame game to somebody else. Um, and those are the things that I see that help people grow up. And so I teach them about the, the fear of loss is actually the thing that's causing you to lose. You lose the fear of loss, you'll stop losing. Yeah. You'll start winning because you'll be different than most people. Right? I love that. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really true. Um, and, and so as a CEO, how much time of your day or how much you know, of your week is spent on building culture and building these, these traits and these values in your senior team? And, then, and, and that's the thing. I mean, the more people you have, yeah. the harder it is for it to trickle down, right? Yes. Because you can only reach so many people on a daily basis, which is usually the, your direct reports. Right. But then making sure that that is trickling down, right? That domino effect down into the, you know, the very first level of the organization. Sure. Right. How yeah. much time do you spend? At least half. Yeah. 
and, and, and where I get the most joy in my day is the one-on-one -on -one coaching. You know, and I talk to my team about this too because everybody has different strengths, is that I can sit there and be in coaching sessions and working with my leadership team on how, the, how they're doing, not on tactical things, but how they're doing emotionally and how they're doing with their communication. Um, it's so critically important because that, then they'll pass it down, right? I can't touch everybody. Um, I see them once a quarter uh, or in the hallways when you know, we go you know, just walk around the organization. But it's that I, I spend at least half my time on that. And, and, and sometimes they're probably sick of hearing me talk about it because I, it, to me, it's a process right. of so wash, rinse, and repeat. Talk about it from a different angle. Talk about it in a different way. Um, we actually even brought on a communication coach um, that spends three days a week at our office wow. working with our leadership team on communication, both individually and in groups. So that actually has, acts as a facilitator so they can practice communication, wow, right? Because it really comes down to communication. Poor communication creates a, a cultural problem, right? If I don't talk to you about this or I don't, um, or I act like it doesn't exist, um, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly hiding. That's when you start getting a lack of trust in the organization. And when people don't trust, they just put their head down. They just try and do the bare minimum. They're just trying to keep themselves out of trouble. You know, they're never going to add value to an organization, right? So true. Uh, so true. I'm going to shift gears because I know sure. we talked about, but I really knew that I that was one of the topics I wanted to talk with you about because you and I talk about it so often yeah. um, at some of our Vistage meetings, uh, and I think it is one of the greatest challenges for leaders today, especially today. I think because of the multi generational uh, workforces right. that we're dealing with, right? And we're all different. Um, and you have to meet people where they're at there because mm -hmm. everybody is different to your point. Yeah. I can't have the conversation with a millennial the same way I'd have it with somebody, you know, who's a baby boomer. It's a different kind of conversation, but that's again, meeting people where they're at in their communication. Yeah. And I think, you know, being a baby boomer, I mean, you know, sometimes I think I, I know myself, I have to catch myself sometimes thinking that, you know, well, why, why is everybody gone at five o'clock? <laughs> right. And I'm still here till nine, you know, exactly. Well, because my, gen you know, when I was did, coming right, up, right, you, right. you lived to work. It was work, dog hours. Right? Look, and, it, you yeah. know, as they say, you, we live to work. Yeah. They work to live, right. right? I wish, and I'm learning from them, how to try to That's have right. a little more balance in my life. So I think being open to all the different things that the different generations bring to the table is so important as yeah. a leader. Um, but I want to touch on, because you're doing some really, really exciting stuff. And so I want to, mm. I definitely want to spend a little time talking about some of those initiatives uh, that you're doing. One of the things I also read when I was doing a little bit of cool. spy work on you um, was that when you were creating some of these shows, um, one of the things that you focused on was women. Yes. Um, from, from different aspects. So, and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about that diversity and that focus. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, for us men that are out there, is that uh, women make 87% of all purchasing decisions. They influence another eight. So we are literally making a decision less than 5% of the time. <laughs> but we make you think um, you're making right, decisions. Exactly. So um, I would say to you is that, so, you know, our programming was targeting to women because women are making most of the day-to-day -day decisions in the household um, when it comes to raising children, when it comes to, you know, dealing with the household finances, uh, travel, you know, all those things. So uh, we wanted to empower women to make better decisions in their life by giving them better information. And we realized that that's a, that's a market that maybe is not being as well served as it needs to be served. Um, and so that's, that's why we chose that. Plus, I have three girls at home and a, and a girl wife. dog and a girl. And a girl. Dog, oh, my gosh. Right you have a beautiful bride. You, you know. are yeah, you're so in I'm, trouble. I'm surrounded by women. And at work, I'm surrounded by women. So uh, that's why we're doing so well, just so you, get, you, you know. You have great insight into exactly. what women want just being it. at home. Um, and so I thought that was really fascinating yeah. that, that you zeroed in on that and, uh, and saw that as a niche, yeah. uh, kind of a niche. But you're also working on another project. Uh, with Montel Williams, correct, yes. uh, which focuses on veterans, which is another population that I think is uh, so deserving of our yeah. attention. Well, you know, Montel just joined our, we have a series called Military Makeover. We make over the homes of vets that are returning from overseas. Um, we're on our 21st family. Matter of fact, our, the next one is down here in South Florida. We're actually uh, doing a, a, a local family who was uh, affected by the Stoneman Douglas mm -hmm. tragedy, the wife of uh, Chris Hickson. Uh, we're redoing, we're remodeling the home that they, they, they were together in. And, but Montel
Chappelle's come on to that show, and he's added a lot of unbelievable energy to this sh the show. I mean, he had the longest running talk show yeah. on TV, but it, he was always very passionate about these issues. So military makeover just fits into the theme for us, is, and that theme is we're giving back to, to the people who are giving back, right? They're sacrificing their lives for us. So uh, what can we do to actually even just shed a light on all these issues that our, our, our vets returning back home are facing? And most of it's are the invisible issues of PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's huge. And yeah. so uh, getting them back into the workforce, you know, so we do a military career special on top of making over the home, um, Operation Career. And it is, it, it's, it's, it, there's just not enough talking about that right. that's happening. So how do we make a positive impact on people's lives? Well, people are sacrificing. So how do we actually come around and, and, and love on them and, you know, truly tell them thank you for your service because we're free because of their efforts. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I love what, what you're doing on that front. Um, I, I think that um, it, there's so many things that Brandstar does. I mean, I, I, as, as long as I've known you, I don't even think I could tell everybody <laughs> everything that they do. Um, and so I think the diversity of the services that you offer yeah. um, and, and uh, you know, how was that planned or did that just kind of go down? I don't think it was planned that way. It started out with that premise. We have our television shows that are solution-based television programs. And then when we were engaging with different brands to be on our shows as subject matter expert, because if you think about a brand, why do they create a product or service? It's usually to solve a problem or to solve a problem better, right? Um, and so these brands were coming to us and say, this is a great opportunity for us to educate your audiences, but we really want to do some traditional marketing. And so kind of we birthed out of our TV production company, these full service, I call them agency like services. So we do everything that a traditional ad agency would do from, you know, doing social media, um, creative media buying, both digital and traditional. Um, but it's all ultimately about telling a brand story, you know, because right. brands, each brand has a unique competitive advantage. And so how do they tell that story? Um, determines how well they do. Some, most time, most cases, not necessarily the best brand wins. It's the brand that actually had the most exposure. Mm -hmm. And so I want to get those brands, especially the ones that are the, the uh, up and comers, more, you know, more exposure about telling their story about what, what makes them unique and different. Yeah, I, you know, I think that is, I love that, how, that right? Get, coming at the clients or the sponsors mm -hmm. or, or yeah. uh, as uh, from a holistic approach to their needs. Uh, I can tell you that since I've been here, which is about four and a half years, I'd like to think that our, our brand has grown uh, over the years and using social media and, and as much marketing. We don't have the resources, obviously, that a company, a bigger company right. has, but with what we do have, uh, we, we've, I totally get. Yeah. If we aren't telling our story, then right. people don't know the good things and that we're doing. And nobody is, right? And that's the thing is right. you're, you're making... You, <clears throat> Junior Chief is making such an incredible impact that is an impact on a young life that has 50 years from now is going to benefit from what you're doing today, right? And how do we tell that story to the larger community, right? How do we, how do we change our community? Well, it's going to be those young people, that next generation that's coming up. Absolutely. And, you know, you're, you're, you're taking kids that literally without your direction might have gone down a, not, not a great path, right? right. And you're redirecting them because you're giving them purpose and people need purpose, and showing them that they're capable. It doesn't matter where, where they come from, you know, what their, what their, 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 their childhood uh, you know, economic uh, situation is. They, they, can, they can have a great life, and they can have a life of significance because they're impacting others. They will pay it forward. So yeah. I think you have to tell your story as often as possible and get as many people engaged around your story because it's such an incredible yeah. story. You know, it's so funny because sometimes I'll say, oh, I, I don't know what to put on LinkedIn. or that. We have so much content. Yeah. We have amazing students who, you know, are being exposed to careers that they would never have known about, right, yeah. and pathways that they could take. Volunteers, mentors, mm. donors, sponsors. Right. I, the list goes on and on, and the stories go on and on. I want to touch on one last thing before, because you talk about giving back. Um, and something that you started was called Brand Star Cares. Yes. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, again, w most of the things we've done have been nationally focused because our shows air on Lifetime Television every morning. Um, and, 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 but at the end of the day, so we're making an impact on people's lives on a national scale. But what about in our own community, right? And so how are we impacting the people that are right around us that grow up next to us? Um, so we, we launched an initiative called Brand Star Cares. And, uh, and the, the initiative is basically we want to come alongside of nonprofits 
that are making a difference in, in, in the community and help support them um, and give back to them and because we want to give back again to those who give back, right? They have a purpose. Their, their purpose fits our purpose, which is making that positive impact. So, um, you know, that our whole Brand Star Cares initiative was birthed out of that. It's a, it's a labor of love from a, a, you know, a, a young lady in our organization, Nicole Oropesa, who has always had a heart for giving back, and, nice. and my partner, Doug Campbell, who literally loves that as well, and that we, we live those values. And they basically said, what can we do right in our backyard? Right? It's right here. And so that's yep. what we launched it, and it's been an exciting couple of years, and the amount of impact we've been able to make locally here is it. special. You know, we enjoy it. every part of it. So I always, you know, I used to, I don't really cook that much anymore, um, mm. but being Italian and Spanish, I do like to cook. Uh, but one of the things I used to love cooking and making, I love to bake, um, was cheesecakes. Mm. And so in every cheesecake, there's one main ingredient, right? Cream cheese. Uh, and so if your recipe for success, what would be your main ingredient? Give first and you'll get back 10x. You know, and don't worry about getting a 10x back because it'll happen, right? And so if you do that and you're willing to, to invest first, uh, you, you'll be shocked about what you're going to give back. Even if it's not immediate, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see it over the course of time. Well, I, I, you know, sometimes it's really interesting because every time we do this, and so you saw me writing, and yes. I was just jotting down some of your ingredients. Okay. Uh, and at the end, we read this back and your recipe. Mm. And it's interesting because most people say, wow, and you see it all on one piece of paper. Mm. And I'm sure that there are other ingredients, but these yeah. were just some of the ones that you touched on okay. today. So I want to kind of read this for our audience, uh, especially that this is also on podcast, so okay. they can't always see it. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned first was, Learning through failures, right, uh, and making sure that you use that as a way to learn and grow and become stronger. Uh, taking risks. You certainly have done a lot of that. Um, yeah. You know, figure it, go for it. Got to yeah. go for it, right? Uh, doing something different, something that somebody isn't doing. Don't be status quo. I love that, and that's one that I live by. Um, hiring for attitude, problem-solving, energy, yeah. um, all of that before skills and yeah. technical skills. Uh, so I think that's been an ingredient for your company's success. Putting people first, right? I think both in your family life as well as yes. in your... Um, Got to do it at home first. Exactly, that's right. yeah. And so Hannah's interview really <laughs> talked about that. Yeah. Um, I bet she did go home and tattle about you. <laughs> she did. Nice uh, to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, building culture, uh, again, with the values that are important to you and that are authentic to you, and some of those were transparency, accountability, respect, yeah. uh, empowerment, right? right, and trusting people to do uh, the right thing. Authenticity, you talk a lot about authenticity and just being real, right, yeah. about who you right. are. Uh, open communication, which I think you're right, is the key to everything. Giving back or giving yeah. first, right? Yeah. I think it's so funny because we've had several guests say that when you give back, whether it's financially <laughs> or in time, um, it comes back to you, yeah, right? It's blessed, like karma. Like, uh, um, and it's are, not just, always in money. It's, mm, no, it's, so. in all, it's just in health. It's in relationships. I mean, joy comes from the inside out, not the outside yeah. in. And when you really give, you get this internal joy that you don't need anything back. Yeah. And, and you wind up getting, you know, 10x anyway. Absolutely. Well, I know that in our interactions, you know, through our Vistage group, you have added so much right. to my life. Um, as a person, as a leader, and so I want to say thank you for uh, that. I'm I really grateful. do. I missed you yesterday. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And it wasn't the same without you. Um, uh, and so I always learn some some tidbit of information. So that that desire and mm. that passion of yours to teach and yeah. to mentor and to help people grow, um, just know that your peers are gaining well, from that as well. And well, so you thank guys you. are my family. I learn as much from you as you learn from me. You also learn by teaching. So I'm grateful to be a part of the Vistage Group. I'm grateful for our friendship. Yes. And um, thank you for having me on yes, your podcast. It was an honor, <laughs> an honor. Uh, and I know that we're going to do some things together. Yes. Uh, we already did some internships together, which was amazing. And so if you would like to learn more about some of those things, the internships, learn more about Brand Star Cares, yeah. uh, and please reach out uh, to either one of us, and we'd be happy to share that. So thank you for being with us today. I uh, hope you'll join us on the podcast when that gets posted on Friday. And just make sure you're out there doing great things, and let's get cooking. Thanks, guys.